This is the Killer Chronicles. The United States Penitentiary in Victorville, California was built and opened in 2004. It was a modern prison model designed to house some of the most dangerous and crafty inmates in the federal system. It was originally conceived in 2001 after public outcry prevented the construction of a new prison in nearby Lompoc to replace the aging penitentiary there. As a result, when Victorville opened in October 2004, it inherited hundreds of high-security inmates from Lompoc, including members of gangs like the Mexican Mafia, the Aryan Brotherhood, and the Nazi Lowriders. Our episode today focuses on the situation in Area 4, where in March 2005, two cellmates, Timothy Ulch and Steven Scapazzi, allegedly worked together with corrupt prison guards to start a contraband business. They were said to be distributing marijuana and tobacco to the whole module, while a third inmate in their area made Pruno by the gallon, which inmates routinely drank in soda bottles in open view of staff. On top of that, Ulch was allegedly having an affair with a female corrections officer, further shielding the pair from being discovered by authorities. The inmates in Area 4 had already figured out how to make and stash knives. Scopazzi was known to unscrew speakers in the TV room and hide the white inmates' community shank in there, for example. While such behavior is typical of prisons all over the world, looking back on the events of April 11, 2005, with the benefit of hindsight, it is clear Area 4 was on the brink of spiraling out of control. On the evening of April 11th, Inmates were on an indoor recreation period, where they were allowed outside of their cells, but not on the outdoor yard. Some were showering, others were ironing their clothes or taking care of other minutiae in their day-to-day -day lives. Scapazzi, by all accounts, was getting drunk on Pruno and not doing a great job at handling his liquor. While in full view of numerous other inmates, Scapazzi began teasing Jose Yogi Murillo, a member of the Southside Whittier Sureño gang, who is serving a prison term for bank fraud and money laundering. It seems prudent to pause the narrative here and explain a bit about Scapazzi's background. Scapazzi was a large fellow, six foot six and 300 pounds, and not one to back down from a fight. He was serving a 14 year prison sentence for operating a mobile meth lab and carrying a gun in Florida and he had done his fair share of prison time in his 37 years. But Scapazzi wasn't a hardcore gangster. He was homeless when he was arrested, addicted to methamphetamine, and though he had all of his possessions in his vehicle where he was also allegedly cooking meth, he wasn't found with stacks of cash as high-profile drug dealers often are. One thing that separated him from others who ended up in the federal justice system was the mystery about his identity. Scapazzi used many names. It's not 100% clear that his real name was even Steven Scapazzi. He also went by Kenneth Ferguson, David Fisher, and Big Dave, among a host of other aliases. He had at least two social security numbers, and federal prosecutors in Florida said they weren't able to do a thorough background check on him because he was able to change his identity with ease. Back to the narrative. Scapazzi might have intended his remarks to Yogi that night to be in jest, but that's not how Yogi took it. A few minutes later, Scapazzi upped the ante when he entered Yogi's cell on the lower range of Area 4 while Yogi was sitting on the toilet and made an aggressive gesture. A few minutes after that, he began to shadow box with Yogi, who at this point was seething. Other white inmates saw what was going on and began to brace themselves for a possible conflict due to what one would later call Scapazzi's knucklehead behavior. Scapazzi seemed blissfully unaware of what he was getting himself and his friends into by openly thumbing his nose at not just Yogi, but the Sereno gang. Some context. While federal inmates can be housed anywhere in the country, judges commonly encourage the Bureau of Prisons to house defendants near their county of conviction, since contact with loved ones is beneficial to rehabilitation in prison. On the flip side, this can create a situation where local gangs in a particular federal prison can beef up their numbers. This could explain why the Sereno presence in Victorville Prison was so heavy, 
Commonly known as the foot soldiers for the Mexican Mafia, Sureños have membership estimated around 20,000 in Los Angeles County alone and maintain a presence in every region of California. In addition to being one of the most recognizable gangs in the country, it is also the predominant gang in San Bernardino County, where the FCC Victorville Prison Complex is located. Inside prison walls, the Mexican Mafia and the hundreds of Sereno subsets under its umbrella have a reputation as the last group with whom any incarcerated person should want to find themselves in an open conflict. Around 8.12 that evening, inmate Robert Salazar, an elder among the Sereños, made one last-ditch effort to avoid a conflict. He went to Scapazzi's cell, 204, told Scapazzi that he had offended Yogi and asked for an apology. Scapazzi continued to brush aside what had happened and said something along the lines of, We can meet up in the TV room if he wants. A clear challenge for a fight. Another white inmate tried to step in and tell Salazar that Scapazzi was just joking. It's all good, Salazar reassured them. As the next few minutes would demonstrate, that wasn't exactly true. After the conversation at cell 204 with Salazar, Yogi and a group of others met at the stairs between the lower and upper tiers at Area 4. They included Oscar Lonely Rodriguez, Alejandro Slow Mujica, Danny Monster Martinez, and Walter Littleman Meneses. All the men were associated with various Los Angeles area cliques of the Sereno gang. The plan was for Lonely, Yogi, and Slow to go inside cell 204 while Monster and Little Man stayed outside and kept watch. As the group was talking, Ulch departed cell 204 to go take a shower, but Scapazzi was not left alone. Two other inmates, Ryan Davis and Wayne Graham, remained in 204 with him. Davis would later testify as a prosecution witness that when the three Sereños entered the cell, their eyes were hard, their teeth were locked, and their jaws were clenched. What the fuck's up now, Dave? Yogi allegedly asked. Then they began to attack, swinging knives at Scopazzi and Graham, both of whom were struck multiple times as they tried to defend themselves. The fight soon spilled out into the range of the upper tier, and that's when Monster and Little Man joined in, punching and kicking both Graham and Scapazzi. The commotion was loud enough for Ulch to catch wind that something was up, and he hurried back to join in the fracas, just in time for the attackers to turn their knives on him. Meanwhile, another Sereno, Victor Mono Rocha, saw what was going on and he too rushed over to help, covering 140 feet in just three seconds to join the fight. He grabbed Scapazzi by the ankles from behind and flipped him face forward into the concrete floor. Then he and Monster tried to throw the 300-pound Scapazzi over the railing. In the end, Graham, Scapazzi, and Ulch had all been stabbed. Scapazzi and Ulch required hospitalization. Doctors later determined that Scapazzi had been stabbed in the lung and the liver, causing internal bleeding. Though he was completely alert and appeared to be recovering after the attack, Scopazzi took a turn for the worse four days later and was declared brain dead. He died on April 16th at 6.02 p.m., almost exactly five days after the stabbing. In the aftermath of Scopazzi's death, the FBI and the Bureau of Prisons began to unpack why six Sereños had planned and carried out a brazen prison homicide indoors in front of security cameras. A prison kite that authorities later intercepted from Yogi to Lonely made the gang motive behind the murder crystal clear. It said, We know what the fuck happened in the cell. The Vato disrespected the Sir, so fuck him, S.A. To me, they got what they had coming, because I'm 100% rider, homeboy, and a motherfucker that disrespects the Sir like that, they got something coming. Fuck the FBI, the 187, and all the scary motherfuckers. In September 2005, just five months after the attack, Yogi, Lonely, Slow, Monster, Little Man, and Mono were indicted on charges of murder, conspiracy, and assault. The trial happened in 2008, and the jury seemed to keep an opened mind throughout. Only Yogi, Lonely, and Slow, 
the three stabbers were convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Little Man was convicted of assault and got five years, while Monster was convicted only of throwing kicks during the fracas and received just six months. Mono was tried separately, convicted of assault, and received 87 months in prison. As they argued for leniency, Yogi's attorneys insisted that Yogi only stabbed Scapazzi in self-defense when Scapazzi pulled a knife first. As the case was moving toward trial, defense attorneys came across a potential bombshell when they began exploring a key question. Why did it take five days for Scapazzi to die when he appeared to be on track for recovery at first? The defense came up with an expert witness, Chief of Emergency Medicine at UCLA Medical Center, Dr. Marshall T. Morgan, who opined that Scopazzi, quote, would not have died of his injuries had he received minimally competent medical care. Morgan said that doctors at the Victor Valley Hospital failed to monitor Scopazzi's hemoglobin levels or do a CT scan of his abdomen, both of which are standard procedure. In the end, this revelation made no legal difference because the stabbing was still the proximate cause of Scapazzi's death. But it was yet another embarrassment to go along with the corruption among prison staff and the fact that a fatal stabbing occurred within the first six months of the prison's existence. That's it for now. Thank you for listening. If you have any stories that you would like us to cover, tell us about them. Please like and subscribe.